Are there any underlying inefficiencies at your company that are keeping it from fulfilling its potential? Well, our guest today is just the person to find them out. Pete Gibson, or as I like to call him, the turnaround guy, has built a widely respected reputation making stops as a CIO and CTO at various companies, most recently Friendly's and Johnny Rockets restaurants, where he came in and massively improved their overall functionality and their PL. Tune in to learn how he uses technology and team building strategies to maximize IT output, plus why too many leaders in the C-suite don't actually know how to partner with the IT division, and why his nearly 15-year military background has proven useful in his professional career. But before we get into this interview, I want to give a quick shout out to our amazing sponsors, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, for making this whole show possible. If you haven't checked it out yet, go check out their second edition State of Commerce report. It includes tons of insights from thousands of industry leaders. So definitely go check it out at sfdc.co slash commerce insights. That's sfdc.co slash commerce insights, all one word. Okay, let's get into the episode with Pete Gibson. Pete, I'm so excited to chat today. Welcome. Nice to be here. So you are known as like the turnaround guy. You come into all these companies, you turn them around, you make them more successful, but before we get into all that, because that'll be a large focus of the conversation, I want to start with your time in the military because you were there for uh -oh. 14 years or so. 14 years active, and then I finished up in reserves. Yeah. Okay. So I want to hear a bit about what were you doing? Uh, like, what did that look like? And then we're going to get into some lessons that you pulled into this most recent part of your life. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, I grew up in Central North Carolina mm -hmm. and got a liberal arts degree. And then I said, and I did about two years of not-for-profit. And then I said, well, you know, I got this human relations not-for-profit thing. I want to go in the military and pick up leadership. I had a great, only had a two-year commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, okay, two-year commitment, surface line. And I was driving destroyers. And then I was going to go back and get an MBA. But for the first time in my career or life, I was challenged. And so I really dug in and was having a good time because I was growing as an individual. Mm -hmm. And um, and in the in Navy's infinite wisdom, they said, we're going to take this liberal arts major and we're going to put you down a technology path. So there's a young, here's a young naval officer and they're reading all about the Soviet Navy and RF propagation and network and how to jam radars and defeat missiles and all this other stuff. And that's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, so, I'd say so. Uh, did well, and then at a young age, I fleeted up to run all the uh, computer operations and the ship operations, and then uh, went ashore, taught fleet tactics to senior officers, and then I came back and was a, a department head on a ship and had all, at a pretty young age, I had all the responsibility for uh, all the weapons, all the electronics, the whole fighting side of the ship. Yeah, and had about that, you know, typical military at a uh, hundred and thirty people at um thirty years old. Mm. And then and then also we had things like back in the day, and you can say it now, you know, here's a young thirty year old guy that says, hey, we're gonna move the nuclear weapons on board today or mm -hmm. or not. And mm -hmm. so it was pretty pretty interesting. So you, you grew. You had yeah. to grow quickly. And then they came to me and said, Hey, you've got a pretty good career and we need guys like you and so where do you want to go next and they were they detailed they really nice they said here's 20 positions yeah and they were never been in the in the military I would tell you they don't always detail you they say here's three got 20 minutes figure it out let me know when off you go mm -hmm. and i gotta go well all right and he said give me a call back tomorrow and so they wanted me in the tomahawk program because i had the experience and but they really wanted me in the pentagon i really didn't want to go to the pentagon so I ended up at a little place called Dahlgren, Virginia, which okay. is when I was, when my wife and I went up there and she was expecting our first child. It's a, it's, you know, it's a pretty sleepy little base, 60 miles outside of DC, close enough. We're there. So I went in and so I reported in and there are only like 20 military guys there, probably only 10, 15 officers, at least in our section of it. And um, so then they said, you're over in this building. Yeah, they do something with the tomahawks. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I walked in and I had 350 civil servants reporting to me. And I was responsible for developing all the tomahawk cruise missile system, which in the 90s was one of our, was one of our best systems. 
And I didn't have the ordinance. I had all the computer control systems. And so out of it, I learned, you know, on the ship, I was an operator here. I had to learn to develop high reliability code, high reliability systems. And so I learned system engineering, project management, financing, how to develop high reliability codes, software quality assurance, and things of that nature. And we put it on, of course, our submarines, our surface ships, put it on the UK and the Trafalgar class uh, submarine for the UK, learned all these big things. And I couldn't, you know, I was the young officer there, right? That was the token officer. The rest of them were all civil servants. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm, and I had some of the the nation's leading people in coding and systems and things like this, working at this national lab. And you know, here's the young guy, and he kind of go, hey, well, I ain't going to tell them how to code when I don't know how to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to take what this pro organization did really well, and was able to sell it to other programs. And we were able to grow this program along the way. So we were actually really, really successful in what we did at that time. But more importantly, it set me up for how to run a technology organization, how to develop high reliability code and high reliability systems, not just test quality into it. Mm -hmm. And that set me up for a great commercial career. Wow. Okay. So I want to hear a bit about how you think about coming in and leading any team when maybe you don't really know exactly how to do the thing, you know, you don't maybe know how to write the code or whatever it might be, but you come in and you're able to kind of, you know, lead with this authority and have 300 something people following you when you don't exactly know how to do what they're doing, maybe like, what does that look like to, you know, create that kind of like leadership, um, yeah, skill set in front of all these people? Um, I normally when I come in, I spend the first amount of time listening and learning. I want to know what you are doing. I want to know what makes you click. I want to know what makes the organization click. There's something about Stephanie that gets her excited. I want to hear from Stephanie what we do well and we don't do well. And I'll spend a large amount of my time talking to people outside the organization, inside the organization. And then at which point I start looking for quick wins. Mm -hmm. What I've often found is I've gone into these organizations. I've never had to do scorched earth restructuring. To be honest with you, a lot of it is I find that there hasn't been good leadership. We as IT and technicians, we don't bring up our next group of people very well. We don't look at them and say, this is what you need to be CIO. We kind of go do your job. And then mm -hmm. if there's a need, we're going to pick from somebody. And so we don't prepare them. And so I look, focus on the individual, what makes them tick, how do we get them to grow, what do they get excited about, what do we do well in the organization, what do we need to improve, and then I start laying out a plan to go and improve the organization. Mm -hmm. and, and it's often the thing is that, you know, it's not about Pete Gibson working hard. Yeah, I do. I, just, well, I actually say I do half days, right? Seven in the morning until seven at night, and then I'm on call all night long. But it's about how do I take this organization and how do I get 2%, 3% 3 more productivity out of it? Mm -hmm. So what are our processes and procedures? How do we develop code? A lot of people would develop code, they'd been code, but then at the end they realize when they get in a test, they get it, oh, oh look, we got all these defects. And so they miss the timeline. If you miss the timeline, you're missing the budget. If you have customer satisfaction issues and so forth. So you ask them, how do you really develop high reliability code? Uh, I don't know. How do you have good IT services for your customer? Uh, and maybe you'll get, if they're halfway decent, they'll give you an IT discussion. And, and how do you energize these people to go do good things or see your staff to go do good things? And it eludes most technology leaders. Mm -hmm. They kind of just sit back and, you know, I do my job type thing. And then their perspective is I run tech, I do tech. They don't have the perspective that they're there to improve the business. And so all the things that you go do to have a good tech organization and make sure you're successful, if they do it well, they are going to impact the business. Uh, case in point at, at, um, at Friendly's, 
Uh, we were kind of a prickly team, took them up to the next level. IT put in systems. Pre-pandemic, IT was delivering 20, 25% of the business. IT made Friendly's, a beloved brand in New England that's been struggling for years, made them profitable. Mm -hmm. How long was that time period? That was about, I uh, got there in August and the following December, the operations team reached across the executive table and said, you know why we're profitable? And I go, no, because I'm heads down by the organization. It's because of you guys in IT. And it's not me that did it, but it was the IT team that did it. My point of sale person says, we can go do this to improve. We can do this to improve. But we're all headed down the strategy of having better IT services and improving the business. And no capital either. Because we were, we were, they weren't the company that wasn't making money, private equity owned. What are you going to go do? And it comes down to the leadership of getting people to trust you, uh, working with them, empowering them, rewarding them. It doesn't have to mean comp. It just means rewarding them for great work and so forth. And also setting the example too. You've got to, you can't talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. Yep. So I want to use this episode as like a mini case study because you've turned around a lot of companies. So yep. first, can you um, talk about, you know, what companies have you been CIO, CTO? What have your roles been at a very high level before we move further into this case study that I'm about to pull you through? Yeah, it was kind of funny. Um, so I came out of the military and the first position was uh, IBM.com. Lou Gershner didn't uh, want e-commerce late nineties, just new thing coming out. And he didn't want every organization to, um, every big section in IBM to have their own e-commerce presence. He said, we're gonna go do this once and so forth. And so I'll put together IBM.com. Now I didn't have the software side at the time. I had the operation side of it. And what was funny was that two guys before me uh, quit, the guy before me had a mental breakdown and they brought me in and because of the military and process procedures, you kind of look at it and you go, well, you know, I don't really want a place for this organization to go. And that's up. So let's get out of getting it up here, guys. And, and so off we go. And so we did that, got that established. At that time, I said, I want to be a traditional CIO. So I went to uh, Alamo National. It's like everyone going into a new company, you do your due diligence, we profitable. Yeah, you know, we got that, we just spun off. We got rid of all the bad baggage. We're good to go and so forth. And I said, so that became a, I was a divisional CIO there. And so they said, we watched you live in Fort Lauderdale. I said, cool, but you're going to work in Ohio. I go, okay, that's fine. And so I get up there and, and, um, turned it around, kind of a prickly team, kind of mutinous. And then all of a sudden 9-11 hit. And next thing you know, man, thousands of cars abandoned on the streets. This weak company, a month later, files chapter 11. So what do you do when you go into chapter 11? You can't run scared. You've got no resources. And so the, the IT team there did a really good job. They put a new system out into all these local market divisions that showed how it allowed them to uh, improve the operations. They were still key whacking in contracts in, in some big back office. This mm -hmm. system said, you know, you do that. It's out in the field, it's distributed. And we cut the whole back office down and the IT team cut 30% of the corporate overhead down. Wow. So uh, we eventually shut that unit down because of that system, believe it or not, because we learned how bad the numbers were in that business unit. And it was the IT team that actually shut that business unit down because they had all the different pieces of it. And then I went down and did restructuring in Germany, was in the UK, and then restructuring in Fort Lauderdale and eventually sold it to Cerberus. And that's where I got the business and IT turnaround aspect of it. Went to Wisdom, Windows, at that time they'll send it. They couldn't get an application out the door to save their life. And they tried to launch this uh, e-commerce site and it was terrible. Didn't have all the proper content in it. And, um, so they had me just out in Scottsdale and it says pretty nice there. And they fired the CIO and they fired the head of development. And they said, we want you to come run this thing. You're our bench strength. And so we got in there and, and we turned it around. out. I mean, they could literally could not get an application out the door. We were, and we had four years later, they are an information week, top 500 IT organization. We're generating $10 million in EBITDA by selling services to the franchisees. We could. Uh, we were putting, we developed a system development life cycle. 
we were putting systems out right and left. We were having, we were an ITIL organization. Service went sky high to all of our customers. There's no longer the IT black hole. And, um, you know, it was a huge success. But do it you wasn't... keep the same team when you go in? Like, do you keep a lot of the same people? Like, yeah. Or do you have to kind of hire new ones? No. I'm only, I'm, what I normally find is the people are really good. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that there is no one has given them good leadership. Mm -hmm. No one has told them that, you know, that's terrible. You, you don't kill them in per, you know, but, you know, in public, but you have a, you know, I have a communication plan and then I have one-on-ones with them. You said, yeah, we could have done a better job at that. Or when it was a success, yeah, you do have a team meeting or your Friday afternoon session or whatever your thing is. You, you reward people publicly for a great job. You know, I write notes, but I engage with folks walking around. And the next thing you know, we develop a methodology that when they all start becoming successful with it, because they all want to be successful. The average, to me, the average person wants to be successful. And so there's the methodology of the system development life cycle. And it took a little coaxing. And they didn't want to do it. Some people thought it was too restrictive. Others said it didn't tell me how to do my job. But then all of a sudden they started doing it. I said, humor, we're going to try once. They were successful. I said, we're going to do it two or three more times. We're going to do that. A year later, we were putting so many products out the door successfully on time, on budget, that my head of architecture, a great guy by the name of Nick Forte, came to me and said, we got problems. I said, what's the problem? He goes, we got too many things going out the door at the same time. Our interdependencies are locked down. Uh, we said, all right, let's go lock it down. And so I you know, we had to move one. I had two weeks, one behind a week. I'm calling customers saying, I'm going to move you back. Here's why. And they all got it. Mm -hmm. But it was, at the end of it, it was the team that was doing it and not me. Because the team was doing it, we were doing, you know, we got that one, two, three percent of performance improvement. And so when you have that team, I think that was about 300 people. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of man hours that that team is doing. Yeah. And I had folks saying, you know, hey, we focus on revenue. Yeah, one young man says, you know, in my old position, we used to uh, take our training and submit it to the state, and they would reimburse us for it. So really, and he says, I think we can go do that here too for the training that Wyndham does as a hotel company. I go, really? So sure enough, here's a young 28 year old person gets a check from the state for. Million five, two million dollars. Wow. By understanding what was going on and empowering him and allowing him to work to go do it in a structured environment. Mm -hmm. What was your process that you brought in to get the team to be start shipping more products where you're saying some of them were on board yeah, with it, it or some of them said it didn't fit? Like, what does that look like when you come in and get So I'm an old, uh, hate to say it, I'm an old waterfall guy. And um, so I'm. Back in the government, I was capability maturity model, CMM. So you have your process. And CMM is a, a process. It's, you will have your processes in place. People will understand your processes in place. Oh, by the way, there is a software development life cycle. But because we had so many problems, like equipment would show up in the data center and the infrastructure team wouldn't know what to do with it. And all these other things, a lot of communications. We kind of developed a system development life cycle around a project team that says, oh, by the way, every one of you guys have got to participate. Business customer, development, project management. Oh, by the way, infrastructure, you guys were all upset, complaining about equipment showing up. Uh, you're going to be on the team also. Service desk, at that time was a help desk. We have one on the ITIL yet, but the service desk. Always complaining. We always we find out when a product's been launched when the customers start calling us. I go, oh, okay, well that's gonna stop. You're gonna be on the team also, so you know what's going on. You know, by the way, all of you guys have deliverables along the way. What's the support plan for the product service desk? I want it before we launch. We documented all this stuff and said, here is the process. We educated everybody on the process. We struggled through doing it the first time. But then at, at, at the end of it, they all, everyone understood the process. And a year later, they know this is what I need to go do today. There's no mm -hmm. chaos. There's no pulling people around. There's no, the crisis was out in the organization. The people were doing their job. The project teams were all working together. 
no micromanagement from the top anymore. They were self teams and they were driving the products out the door. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're all relying on each other and they actually know who each other are Absolutely. and who Absolutely. owns what. And they're working together. It's a great thing. And then, oh, by the way, you know, guess what? Sizing was done appropriately. Networking sizing was done. Security was in on it. Everyone knew what was going on. The customer had his things he had to go do along the way. And at the end of it, test, would test had to do their test plans along the way. Mm -hmm. And so once it went through all the development wickets at the end, there's a go, no, go meeting. Everyone votes. Do we go or don't go? And but everyone is also ready. Yeah. And so, and then out the door it goes. You know, and we would also version that we, we would version our processes too, because we would learn along the way. So mm -hmm. version one was the first one. We always learned a few things. Then we came up with 1.1 and redid the documentation and then retaught everybody. So here are the new changes into it. And now we're meeting a typical IT meeting, pizza, Mountain Dew, good time. Here's the changes, train them and off they go. And now have their documentation by their desk and stuff like that. So they did, a, uh, they did, a, they did a really good job. That's, that's awesome. Do you think there's value in having a cross-functional team to be able to like help pull all these units together? Or did you just kind of pull these teams together and just let them work it out? No, I'm a huge believer in cross-functional team. Mm -hmm. I okay, ended up using yeah. almost cross-functional teams everywhere I go. Okay. Uh, when I was at Friendly's here, when I first got in, operations wanted to go do something. And then all of a sudden the accounting team is saying, yell, stop, stop, stop. And what's yep. it, we don't know if this is going to work. What about taxation? What about all this other stuff? Stop, stop. I said, <clears throat> enough of that. So as we started doing projects and then it was business is there. Accounting is there. The IT, the appropriate IT guys are there. And then there is a project team and we meet every week. And oh, by the way, there is a project plan. Oh, you all help create the project plan. I didn't have a development. We weren't mature enough to have a development cycle yet, but this is the project plan. And then the next thing you know is they're all accountable for their pieces. They're all delivering and it goes out. Now, sometimes they gripe too many meetings, whatever. And I just guess, and, you know, okay, you ask too many meetings, this, that, the other. And you just kind of go and say, well, what would you rather have? Chaos. And you not know what the hell is going on, or would you rather have a go to a couple extra meetings? Your choice. Let me know. If you want to go back to chaos, I can do that too. And they go, go well, uh, uh, okay. And said, oh, by the way, the other thing is the systems are rolling out, have business value. You're making money off of it. And they kind of go, wow, this is pretty good stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Okay. So after Wyndham, where did you go next? I went to Bridge Street, did one year at Bridge Street. I was a friend of the person who headed up international was CEO at Bridge Street and they had trouble figuring out their data. So I said, I'll, I'll do a year there. And, um, so I went to Harlan, Virginia and, uh, got their data sorted out. Really small team got their short, uh, data sorted out. But along the way I said, you know, humor me, what are we paying for apartments? So here's a piece of information over here that will, they tell you apartment complexes, just like in hotels do this also, by the way, but apartment complexes will tell some type of service, how much they're, uh, selling their apartments for just so they can get everyone else's information and they know how to price appropriately. And I go, well, I want to tap into that. And I want to say, this is what I paid for all my apartments. And I want to know how I benchmark against them. And it's easy to go do and locate and so forth. And then. We just rolled out a real simple BI tool at that time. It was click view is now click technologies. I think, and we just said, Hey, here's our apartment, put a pin on it. And then, oh, by the way, conditional code it that if we're below retail green, if we're within 2% yellow and if we're over, let's go red. Oh my God. Look at all those reds. And we will find out that we're about 5% over retail. And so renegotiate the contracts and drop right to the bottom line. And it was a couple of IT guys. We had a BI person go do this and uh, the controller kind of said, can we go do this? We go, yeah, let's try it. So you basically come in, you do, a, you do the job and then you're like, all right, I'm out on to the next one. I mean, that's like a theme I keep hearing. You come in, you fix the thing and then you hop to the next. Come in, fix the data set, install a BI tool and then hop to the next well, anyone thing. Can, anyone can run an organization. Yeah. It's hard yeah, to... and half the, and I tell you, half the fun of it is 
Yeah, that's what, you know, people, the big, people have often, you'll often, maybe one of the questions would be, say, what are you most proud of in your career? I kind of go, <laughs> people want to work with me again. Mm-hmm. These people still reach out to me because it was hard work, but they got something done. And that has a lot of value to them. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the best things I, I'm most proud of is I can go in and work with a group and we have IT ad business value and impact. And mm -hmm. as you know, I do, people ask me to do podcasts uh, quite a bit. You know, yeah. it wasn't a one-up, it was like a regional podcast. And the question was, what were you doing when the pandemic hit? Or what did you do? And so they asked one guy, he said, well, I was working on my network. Another guy said, I was trying to get my workforce mobile. <laughs> and they go to, they go to Pete and say, Pete, what were you doing? I go, I was trying to save my damn company. Mm. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, restaurants were closing. Mm -hmm. Restaurant brands were going bankrupt. It's the job of IT to help not just look at getting Stephanie a laptop so she can work from home. It's about how do I put systems in to save the company so Stephanie has a job. Why did you pick Friendly's? I mean, there's so many they restaurants me. that they picked I you. Know, okay. I don't know why they picked me too, to be honest with you, but they well, picked me. I'm sure you have some options. You have some choices, I'm sure. Like, why were well, you any bit surprised. interested to do Well, that's a different story. You will be surprised, actually. Really? Oh. Uh, yeah, you know, we can get into that, but uh, Friendly's Why would I be surprised? Maybe, uh, well, I, let me answer friendly. Then I'll come okay. back into that one. All right. But yeah, so uh, friendly as it was, uh, failed leadership. The guy before me wasn't really cut out for the job. And they kind of saw this old crusty guy that had been <laughs> around and done some things and listen, want him to go do it, right? And so the team did it. So we did a, we finished a um, consolidation, brought Johnny Rockets in, but we moved all their technology up to the cloud and shut down an office and so shut down the corporate office. So that was a pretty easy piece, except the cloud provider was actually pretty terrible. And uh, then we focused on profitability for that. Mm -hmm. But and then I'll get back to your other point that you're asking about it. So why are you surprised when people don't pick you? Because one is they think you're too big. Two is they'll kind of say, well, you know, we just want someone to run our servers. Their vision of IT mm. in the organization is running servers, a laptop, and running technology. Their vision yeah. on it is not IT needs to improve the business. Mm -hmm. And so great, as we all have good friends and mentors and things like that. I got a great guy, Bill Plumundin. Uh, he was... Former uh, CEO of Budget, CEO of Alamo National when I was there. He was a restructuring guy. He did advantage. Just, and I will tell you, he is the salt of the earth people guy. And really just a great per people person, but a great business mind also. So here I was at Alamo National, my second job outside of the military. And um, he says, you know why you're at the table? He says, I want you to make money. I go, okay. That's what you're, that's why you, that's why you as an executive are sitting at the table to help run this company. I got and go, okay, I get it. And, um, so, but now you go talk to the average CIO and you say, well, what's your job? I run technology and it's a different horizon. The CEO's horizon of technology is of the technology executive is to run technology. And not if you're in manufacturing, improve the supply chain, improve profitability. At Friendly's, you have no money, but how can you improve the business? Those are the heady challenges that IT leaders need to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. How do you go in and audit a company to figure out where to even start? When you go into like a Friendly's brand, like an older brand, I'm sure things were probably not being run in the best way. I mean, how do you even decide which like what levers to pull what to focus on like what does an audit look like of a like especially a an older company yeah so uh one thing that i recommend you do everyone does is can don't forget your education so continue to read well what is your professional development because no one's going to give it to you you know by the way if you don't do that then you're kind of expecting your career is going to take care of your development for you yeah bad juju no one's going to do that right so mm -hmm. read and I'm always, and you can't read everything, of course. So, but I subscribe to 
Harvard Business School. I mm -hmm. get their Harvard Business Review and read and you know, pick up the news book and who's the last professor trying to make some money and wrote a book and try to shock it. And then that might be some nuggets of gold. Mm -hmm. And so you pick those up and that's what I go do to, to educate myself. One book that I use over time is uh, Watkins, First 90 Days. And, he's, and he says, so what's your job when you go into a new organization? What is your personal goal for you when you go in? And his premise is, and it's actually pretty good, his premise is your whole thing, and when you first get there, you're a deficit. You are a liability against the company because you know nothing and yeah. uh, you're not adding value. So your whole job is to add value as quick as you can. And he, and he talks about doing it, and he kind of everyone knows does this. Is, so I'll go in and I'll interview. I interview all my business customers, marketing, how how are we doing, what do you need, this, that, the other, how's IT performing, CEO, up and down. I'll even talk to um, admins and things like that because everyone, everyone uses technology at this day and age. And then I'll talk to my own team. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What are our challenges? Those type of things. And then from there, I identify quick wins. I identify quick wins. I start building credibility with my team and I start building credibility with the business. And then from there, that starts giving me a little bit of room to do some strategic initiative. How and much of the quick wins are from you identifying them versus team members who've oh, been there a while yeah, bubbling with ideas? You know, you, you, you will remember this. Remember the big five consulting days? They go into mm -hmm. a university and they hire a, a whole bunch of, excuse me, I shouldn't say this, but wet behind the ears MBAs, and they come out to the place and they're going to put together whatever they're going to go do is. What's the first thing they do? They interview everyone in the company, gathering the information from the company, yeah. and then they go synthesize it and say, here's the plan. And then they charge you big bucks for the plan, mm -hmm. right? You, the corporate knowledge always there's always a lot of corporate knowledge of what works doesn't work and things like that it's how mm -hmm. do you pull it out to educate yourself in the large and then you'll find wow you know we really it we really have crappy service thing because they all tell you i you know i ask it for something and i never hear a response from them you kind of mm -hmm. go well, i think uh, <laughs> that's yeah. the it black hole we got we're gonna solve that one put it on the list Mm -hmm. And so then that leads into ITIL, which leads into service desk, which leads into incident management, get the processes in place. And they all start going, ooh, that's kind of interesting. And then, oh, by the way, and then the, our service desk gets a new ticketing system. She puts a client in on everybody, and there's no more IT black hole. And then everyone says, it's kind of like it. But you know what happened to IT? They're out of chaos, too, because now they people put in tickets. They triage them. They put them in. We do a satisfaction survey af afterwards, and we find out how well we're doing. Now, this is not rocket science. This is ITIL 101. Yeah. But a lot of people don't implement it. They just kind of say, we do ITIL, here it is, and go do it and put a ticketing system in. But they don't have the management. They don't have the KPIs. They don't have the oversight. They're not driving it. They're not, they're not doing those type things to uh, improve the organization, to solve the service issue. Yeah. I mean, it seems like bringing the IT organization into like company-wide KPIs is going to change their mindset a lot and probably get them more excited about their the work they're doing where all of a sudden they're yeah. impacting the business. Is there anything you have to well, do behind the scenes that, with these though? teams to get that? I mean, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Like, what, how do you kind of show them yeah, well, what they're, they're about to be impacting? Yeah, yeah. I got real saying. Yeah, that's great. No one's going to deliver to us on a silver platter, guys. So let's roll our sleeves up and we're going to go do it ourselves. I can develop KPIs. I can develop ones that are just for IT, or I can develop one for IT and the business. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, guess who has business intelligence? Guess who has all the data? Guess who has all the all the tools to go do that? IT. So mm -hmm. let's go do it. Yeah. So what do you think about the environment we're in today? I mean, looking around, you see all these companies going into chapter 11. I'm sure you see so mm -hmm. many things that could maybe be fixed if you were just to get in there and like work with a IT group and kind of show them the way. Like, what do you think when you're looking around right now, of like what things should big companies be thinking about, especially with the landscape and the environment that we're in right now? Uh, there was a guy uh, many years ago, Carr, I think his name was, that wrote, Does IT Matter? Mm -hmm. And 
and it was a pretty controversial book. I think it was mid two thousand or mid two thousand five, two thousand five, somewhere in that time frame. It was a pretty controversial book. You had all the IT guys wanted to put a dagger in the, in the guy, and other people were saying whatever. Yeah. But I would say one thing the pandemic has taught us is that IT really does matter. And uh, it used to be I could go in to an organization. You know, let's say they were laggards in IT, and I could make two or three strategic purchases and correct the services side, and we could be really competitive again. I would tell you that there are companies now that have neglected IT over the year. And when the pandemic hit, they were really weak. Whereas the ones that had invested in IT were, were agile and they were able to pick up new revenue streams a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And so I think now, 15 years later, Carr is irrelevant in his thoughts because IT does matter. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have like a digital backbone, and I will tell you, you know, you heard me, I know, you know, and you'll, you'll pick up on something here and I'll quite be frank. Honest. One of the brands that I talk about was a big success. I noticed I'm not talking about the other brand because they didn't have a digital, they did not have a digital backbone. They were like getting information by polling and things like that. Johnny you Rockets? Is that who we're brand? talking about? Or what brand Megan? are we talking about? Johnny no, Rockets or what? Brand. Oh, but well, I'm wondering. I'm looking at your LinkedIn. Like, who are we talking about here? <laughs> they network. They weren't uh -huh. pulling any information back. Didn't want to invest in it to go do that. Mm -hmm. And so then the pandemic hit. You know what they did? They closed. Mm -hmm. And you could see them. It was literally, it was a global brand. And we could see the pandemic travel around the world because the government, the governments and municipalities were closing restaurants. And we see, well, Asia just shut down or Chile just shut down or oh, Chile came back to life. And we could see it all over the place. Whereas mm -hmm. the other brand had a digital backbone. Because they had a digital backbone, I could put in some services that affected everybody. And when the pandemic hit, yep, restaurants closed. They had delivery. Mm -hmm. and they went down 65%. They did not close and they should have, they could have gone bankrupt actually. And now a business, yeah, yeah. but they didn't close. And I had a great CEO. He was an old school CEO, lovely death. And he put in a good menu that directed the customers and we had the, the technology and the delivery services. And then at that time, the whole industry shifted and they didn't realize it, but they shifted from in-room dining to really an e-commerce company. Mm -hmm. Because it was about your website now. It was about the third party's websites. It was about placement. It was about SEO. How am I driving all people to do more online ordering for you? It was, you know, a pretty interesting time frame. Yeah, it was, you know, the old school thing. CEO wanted to focus on catering. And I looked at the analytics that catering is not selling. I go, I go and see, hey, George, catering is not selling. He goes, okay. So I said, we need to go with dairy. Dairy is selling. Okay, good, goes Derek. And then marketing, we need to change. I don't know. Marketing, we need to change. I don't know. I pointed a salesperson. Honestly, on the story, great lady, Lynn Geiger, give her some credits here. She said, I'm tired of this. I'm just going to change it myself over the weekend. Because she would do it in the point of sale. It would go out to all the delivery services. And she's mm -hmm. obviously going to do it over the weekend. So she spent a What did she want to do? Uh, like, what, huh? what, was wrong with the, what was wrong with the point of sale? And what did she want to do? No, it wasn't nothing that was wrong with it. But as okay. you do... The priority in the delivery services, you can prioritize what you want to highlight first because the CEO was a delivery person and was a catering person and had success in other chains with catering. That's mm -hmm. what he wanted that we had throughout the organization. So marketing mm -hmm. and all these people didn't want to change. So I went to him and said, Hey, it's not selling. He goes, okay. He said, I said, we're going to go with dairy because it's selling. Here are all the metrics. He goes, okay. And so then I worked with the marketing guys because they kind of owned that piece of it. And they said, no, nah, eh, not do it. So the point of sale lady said, I'm tired of this. And so she went back and she changed all the priorities and all the delivery sites. And Lynn Geiger, a point of sale administrator, did it, implemented it. And a week later, had a 10% improvement in revenue. A sole contributor wow. in fact, the company by 10% by using simple principles. And then I got mm -hmm. on the marketing guys again. I said, placement. I said, you know, all the delivery services are geolocated, right? It's like, okay, real simple. I'm here and right next to us is a restaurant, but I go look at the app. Don't look at what I have on the backside here. Look at their app and I'm down five pages. I ain't going to get no orders. Mm -hmm. So we're going to correct that. Well, you know, they'll give us higher placement if you pay for it. I said, no, 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 no. 
We're talking about a concept called organic placement here. And they go, oh, really? So look, that no images. Got to get images. Oh, just light up. 32 ounce Coke. Well, that's terrible. How about a 32 ounce cold, refreshing Coke? Make it appealing to the consumer. Mm -hmm. They did it. They put it all in place. Guess what happened? They're the second place. Orders start going sky high. And then Just I from saying, pictures, well, hey, images, and text. What? That's it. Just from images and text, and you're images up on... and text and realigning what's selling because a lot of it is, you know, this is e-commerce one on one. Make mm -hmm. it easy for the customer to find the product. If you have a buried okay. deep, it's top one to find the product. But where do you want to put your number one selling item? Top dead center. Let them see it. Mm -hmm. Summertime. So they did all of them. Put that ice cream up top. <laughs> Get some seasonal things well, up there. You are right. Could this sell that was our top selling item was a sandwich. But then the next nine were all milkshakes and sundaes and things of that nature. We were a dairy delivery. We were a dessert delivery business. So let's focus on that. Let's sell it. And so needless to say that by the summertime, we were only down 35%, no dining rooms. And we had no drive through If you had drive throughs you were killing it, but we didn't have drive throughs We're an old beleaguered brand. Mm -hmm. Then limited dining rooms started opening up and 10, 15% capacity, something of that nature. In uh, August, September of that year, we were only down 10%. December of that year, the private equity group was able to sell the company. So wow. IT matters. Yeah. IT can do, do good things. It's so all of these things that we do on a daily basis that it takes a leader, not just an IT leader of the IT organization, but to work in the organization and say, we need to go do this. Mm-hmm. So what do you want to do next? Where's Pete headed? I do turn around. I know. What are you turning around next? Or what are you Whoever looking needs at? Turn around there. Whoever needs it. Um, you don't spot any interesting companies. You see them in the news. You're like, hmm, yeah, the target's kind of interesting. Yeah, or... <laughs> yeah, but sometimes yeah. they already got good leadership. You know, they don't need me. Um, other times, you would jog. And I picked this up doing background. I've done uh, three bankruptcies now in my career. And the... the that built money in the restructuring guy. One of the things he told me was that people that get ready to go into bankruptcy, they're kind of in denial. And he's absolutely right. In other words, the people that are running the company don't realize how bad it is. And so that's what I learned. So they kind of, and, and I said this to one group I was telling, and they said, well, so what's the biggest impediment to us becoming a great technology organization? or using technology to great advantage or something like that. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, what's that organization culture? He said, what do you mean? We got good culture, you know, whatever. I said, no, no, see, your, your, your expectations of IT is down here. You know, it's a little bit of a problem, but no one in this room has ever seen a well-run IT organization. You don't know what it takes to have a well-run IT organization. You don't know what the value, and you know there's value, in it, because you kind of say that, but you don't know what the real value is because you've never experienced it. You don't know that. So when it comes time to things like resourcing, i.e. budget next year to get the team in the organization, they're kind of happy with the way it is. They may give you a little bit more, but it's really not the strategic imperative to go do it. I'll tell you a funny story. I interviewed one company. This was a long time ago. And I interviewed the CEO, and you're kind of like this. He's a former Army, Army guy, Special Forces, by the way. And he says, I want a world-class IT organization. And I go, okay, I can go do that. I mean, I've done that in the past. I can go do that. And then he said, you know, it's really important to us. Got to have a world-class IT organization. And he goes, okay. And then I said, well, how much money do you have for this? Because it's going to cost you money. He goes, well, I, I'm hoping you would let me know. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put together the plan, the budget. Can take a little bit? We're going to go do that for you. But you know something? He goes, what? It's still going to cost you a little bit of money. So I can do this budget constrained if you want to. How much you can give me? How much do you think it's going to be? Now, these are the kind of conversations that recruiters tell you you should have, but be honest with you, you should never have. And he had to go, well, okay, well, we can work on it. And I kind of, and I, Back off the subject. And so then they put me down in the panel interview of the CIO's peers. 
And I said, hey, this guy down with the CEO. And at this point, I was kind of like checking out the organization. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be here. And, I, and I, so I go, CEO said he wants a world-class IT organization. He said, yeah. And they all said, oh, yeah, we need that. And I said, okay, yeah, I can, I go do that. I understand that. I think we're going to do this. Okay, well, that's, that's good. That's good. And then I said, but you know, it can't cost money. I said, you know, where's the money going to come from to go do all this stuff? And they kind of to go, well, uh, 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 uh. I said, so what? You know, either two ways, guys, there's got to be new revenue coming in or someone's going to have to give up money in their budget. We got any new, we got any big plans for new revenue? Well, we might open up one location, two locations next year. Well, I said, that's probably 2%, 3%, 5%. I said, that helps. And I said, but which one of you guys can give up budget? And they look at me. I mean, I just shot their dog. And then one of them comes back to me and says, you know, when IT is operating well, we don't hear about it. And I kind of go, oh, I get it. Troubled IT organization, and you just want the problems to go away. Well, that's a different thing. You should have said that up front, not this world-class IT organization type stuff. So the horizon of a lot of the companies as to what a good IT organization can go do for them is it's, it's beyond their capability. So, I mean, who, who would, if, if I was to go to Stephanie, and go, you know, Stephanie, I think I got an idea that can really propel this organization. I could change the way that we do things and really revolutionize it. I think I can get a telephone pole to fly 1,600 miles and fly through a 10 foot by 10 foot window. What do you think? Okay, show me. <laughs> show me. And they did. No matter before me, but that was mm-hmm. the time I hawk first missile. Mm-hmm. So what was the technology? And the technology isn't as sophisticated as people believe. What is, you know, what was the technology? Well, tight engineering standards. How did they code. go do that? Good and everyone code. kind of thinks like, well, strategically, it was great. Like, yeah. So what was so great about it? It says it took the human out of an engagement to a high-risk target. And I go, yes, it did. That was revolutionary that way. Strategically, though, we put a nuclear capable missile that could fly to downtown Moscow, not on the aircraft carrier, not on 12 or 14 aircraft carriers, but on every destroyer in the Navy. And that made the Soviet Union have to have resources to find every U.S. Navy ship. And it strategically changed the Cold War. Mm-hmm. So, and, and so, you know, I, I throw that out there and that's the, that is the story that, of the cruise missile. But I throw that out there, go talk to your CEO and say, which, if you could have anything in the world, the technology to go do it, what would it be? And they'll probably tell you, I just want the servers to operate. <laughs> so, yeah. long story. Mm-hmm. But you know, but I, well, most technologists will see that. They don't understand the value of what it can do. And the other side of it is, what's new in accounting that's revolutionizing businesses? What's mm-hmm. new in, I don't know, operations? There are some new things in operations. What's new in HR that's really revolutionizing businesses? Probably the area that's really impacting businesses right now is technology. You know, mm-hmm. relegate it to a director level position. Don't have the horizons. Don't look at the educations, what's happening on around them and coming up with some great ideas to really improve their business. Yeah. Well, to me, this interview was very inspiring, thinking about how to bring these teams together. Pete, thank you for hopping on the show today. For anyone who is looking to change their org and transform it and turn it around, where can they find you for help? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. The best way. I'm, I'll spend about an hour a day on LinkedIn answering messages and, and things of that nature. And it's not. And don't be afraid to reach out to me. It's not all about the next position. I get asked a lot of times, what do you think about this? And I'll hop on a, mm-hmm. you know, I'll hop on a quick conference with you real quick and just talk about this, that, and the other one and help you out. That's great. Thank you, Pete. I want to quickly thank our sponsor, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, for help making this podcast possible. If you're looking for the number one platform for all things commerce, there's no better choice. So definitely go check it out at salesforce.com commerce.